Hello all, this is our second le lecture in uh, week two, the 15th Amendment and the split over the right to vote. Um, in this lecture I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the last Civil uh, War Amendment and uh, also some of the issues it called over, caused over uh, the way it defined the right to vote um, and that everyone was pleased with the way it defined the right to vote. So the 15th Amendment was ratified February 3rd in 1870. Um, section 1, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section 2, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Okay, so um, like all the other amendments we've looked at up to this point, um, we can very much see that the first part kind of tells us what the amendment is, and then the last part gives the Congress the right for legislation. Um, and basically what it's doing is it's giving uh, former male slaves the right to vote. Um, you'll remember in week one we talked about uh, Seneca Falls in 1848 being the first women's rights convention and that um, there were men including Frederick Douglass who spoke up for women and how important it was that they get the right to vote. Um, you know, he talked about how um, women would not be able to truly protect themselves or their civil rights without the right to vote. So uh, this, this new guaranteed right that specifically calls out the right to vote um, caused a huge split in uh, the feminist movement. So uh, what happens is there are two sides that develop in the feminist movement. Um, there's the side against the 15th Amendment, uh, which includes, it, it includes excuse me, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth. Um, and I didn't get to talk about her much last week, um, so, uh, Sojourner Truth was an important activist of the time. Um, she supported both women's rights and she was also an abolitionist. Um, she was born into slavery and, uh, she would actually later escape, um, with her daughter, her infant daughter, and she would go back to court to win the freedom of her son. And she would be one of the few women, um, the first black woman to win that kind of court case against a man, a white man in court. Um, and she actually gave herself the name uh, Sojourner Truth. And uh, we won't get to talk about her in detail because as I said before, unfortunately, with our focus being civil rights, we, we have to kind of pick and choose the topics. Um, but she's fascinating because she's one of the first... Um, a black feminist who talks about the intersection in her life between race and gender and how she's affected both as an African-American and as a woman and that these ideas uh, really come together for her. So uh, this is um, something she said at the first annual meeting of American Equal Rights Association on May 10th, 1867. I'm glad to see that men are getting their rights, but I want women to get their rights too. While the water is stirring, I will step into the pool. Now that there is a great stir about colored men's getting their rights, is the time for women to step in and have theirs. I feel that I have a right to have just as much as a man. There is a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about colored women. And if colored men get their rights and colored women not get theirs, the colored men will become masters over their women and it will be just as bad as it was before. So I am for keeping the things going while things are stirring because if we wait till it is still, it will be a great deal to get it going again. 
and you have to think um she makes a really good point that this was a this was a time of change this was a time when um things would start to change and she just wanted to see that change continue and as women will not be granted the right to vote till the 20th century i think that she had a good point about this being a moment to strike while the iron was hot um some people who sided with his side um, started to make, unfortunately, very racial arguments about why women should have the right to vote above African American men. And um, even though we're saying that, that this is kind of one side, you can't always assume that everyone worked together. Um, so in 1869, uh, this group of women formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and this is predominantly the side that was um, against the passing of the 15th Amendment. Okay, so you're going to see there's a, there's a much larger group of, of women's rights activists and abolitionists who were in favor of the 15th Amendment. There's Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, uh, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, Wendell Phillips, and Frederick Douglass. And, you know, I'm, I'm naming some of these names on either side, but I don't want you to think this is a comprehensive list and these are the only people who felt this way. This is just to give you an idea, a sampling of some of the people um, who felt like, who felt like the 15th Amendment um, was right for the time period. Um, and, you know, as I've already said, it's not that that these people were not in favor of women's rights because Frederick Douglass himself spoke at the Women's Rights Convention and spoke up for women um, when others were ready to to voice voice them down and say, you know, the right to vote is too much to ask. It's it's too radical. And, you know, Frederick Douglass said, no, it's important. They can't have civil rights unless they have the right to vote. So let's be clear that he recognized the importance of women voting, but it was, it was a matter of timing for many of these people. Uh, Frederick Douglass on the right to vote for African Americans. It said we are ignorant, admit it. But if we know enough to be hung, we know enough to vote. If the Negro knows enough to pay taxes to support the government, he knows enough to vote. Taxation and representation should go together. If he knows enough to shoulder a musket and fight for the flag for the government, he knows enough to vote. What I ask for the Negro is not benevolence, not pity, not sympathy, but simply justice. Um, so once again, that's just him talking about how important the right to vote is. And clearly he's echo echoing back on patriotic sympathies here um, because we we all know the famous cry of the American Revolution was no taxation without representation and that's what he's saying that this is um, that this is a moment where we have to understand that African Americans are taking their full citizenship under the law and that means they'll be taxed like any other citizen and they therefore have the right to vote uh, another term that's often used during this period is this is called the Negro's Hour. And basically what that's referring to is this idea that, um, that they were not saying that women's suffrage is not important or that it shouldn't happen, but this is the time for African Americans, males, to get their suffrage, to get their right to vote. Um, they'll go on to form the American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and I know it may seem like they're also forming a group, um, but, you know, as I said, their group is, is one that's going to support the 15th Amendment and support African American men in um, this achieving of the right to vote. Okay, so just to conclude, um, my little mini lecture for today is... Um, is talking about the 15th Amendment and how that guarantees male suffrage. Um, although clearly I'm sure that many of you are the history we're going to study. Um, and unfortunately we are also going to talk about topics that infringe upon the civil rights of Americans, particularly African Americans after the Civil War. 
Uh, Reconstruction ends in 1877, and after that, and even before the end of Reconstruction, um, there's a real backlash in the South, and many laws are put in place that infringe upon their suffrage, um, equal protection under the law, uh, and we're going to see a lot of that not even addressed for another hundred years, um, that it really comes to fruition uh, after World War II with the uh, Civil Rights Movement, which we're going to spend a few weeks on, because uh, it's very important to the way we look at civil rights in our country. Um, and the other thing that's important is that this is this causes a huge split in the women's movement, and some even argue that it put women back for their voting. Um, and they make that argument for a couple reasons. One, the statement Sojourner Truth made um, that I said earlier, which is that this was a moment to make changes and that women could have been added into, um, into the 15th Amendment and that this could have been a moment where women uh, achieved the right to vote, but that that opportunity was passed by. Um, Another is some made the argument that this um, put federal controls on voting. Um, some states did allow women to vote. In some state constitutions and local areas, women had achieved the vote. And, and some women's suffrage movements felt like this, this was actually a step backwards because it was saying that women could not vote um, and almost overriding local areas where they might have, have already achieved that women's suffrage. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, I think the third point is undeniable, and that's that this splits suffrage movement. Um, we're going to talk a lot about social movements and movements to advance civil rights. And one thing you have to see in a social movement and a movement to advance social civil rights is unity. Um, there has to be a common goal, and they have to be able to get behind it. Um, and this kind of split the power base of women's suffrage and it won't last forever but right now when maybe it was the best time to to to, to make that change as truth argues um, instead the the movement becomes split over the 15th amendment okay so this is my reference slide this week um, one thing you're going to notice is that there are a lot of um, little biographies and things. Um, some of you may, in your final paper, talk about the right to vote and civil rights. Um, I hope that means you'll go back to some of these early laws, even if you're not comparing this decade with another, because, you know, the one thing that you'll notice about all history classes, but I think even more so about our class, is that one idea is based on another. Um, we can't talk about the later civil rights acts unless we talk about these early acts. We can't talk about the voting rights acts if we don't understand where the right to vote came from um, and what people were fighting for. So thanks guys and uh, you have a great day.